Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, somebody worship Him. Somebody get your praise garment on. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We want to go to the Lord together in prayer. Had a prayer request here, Jada. She's still feeling bad. Oh, had something here says she keeps throwing up. So I was just making sure you're okay. Yeah. She's probably just throwing her hands up in the air and worshiping the Lord. Amen. But we want to keep her or any, that in prayer if she is sick and as well. If you have need in your body tonight, amen, make your way to the front. Amen. All right. All right. Let's remember that in prayer. I uh, won't go into a lot of detail, but let's just say this, that we do need God to touch a very situ special situation in the Feliciano's lives uh, and then do with their granddaughter. And I believe the church can get a hold of God. Amen. As a matter of fact, this is just, uh, uh, brother and sister Feliciano, you want to come around here? We'll get the church to come around you today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister Feliciano, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I'll tell a little bit, uh, has gotten custody of their granddaughter and, um, and is just needing a touch from God to secure that. Amen. Um, and we are believing that God has this child in the right place at the right time. Amen. So ladies, if you'll gather around Sister Feliciano and men, if you'll gather around Brother Feliciano, amen. We want to be able to, amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Father, we know that you are able to do abundantly above all more than we could ask or think. We know, God, that you are able, Lord, to touch the minds of those, God, that may not agree. We also know, God, that when we find favor in your sight, that there are things that transpires in this world that you care for us, Lord. And Lord, I do know that you want this child to be brought up in the truth. And we believe tonight, God, that you are going to do that which you have said in your word. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on. Let's get a hold of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. If you need prayer in your body, now would be the time. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to get the ministry to get you all. Pray for those that need. If you have an unspoken request, lift your hand up in the air right now. All over the building. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer for these needs as well. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, you see these needs. You know them, Lord. Hallelujah. We pray tonight, God, that you move in a mighty way upon them, Lord touch and bless right now in the precious name of Jesus. And we ask you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, yes.
Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. I praise you, God. I worship you, Lord. You are my God, my Savior, my King. I praise you, Lord. I worship you, God. Hallelujah. Can you throw your hands up in the air? Can you praise Him right now? Oh, yeah! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. 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 everything I've got. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to Exodus chapter 14, verse number 10, as well as Exodus chapter 20, verse, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 15, verse number 20. Amen. Two different readings tonight, but in the same story. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 10. The scripture says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die? In the wilderness, wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is it not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptian than that we should die in the wilderness. It would be better for us to have been slaves than for us to die free men, is what they were saying. Exodus chapter 15, verse number 20. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horses and his rider hath he thrown 
into the sea. I want to preach to you tonight the view from behind the timbrel. The view from behind the timbrel. Brother Louis Jean, would you pray? Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Do you remember the test that you had to take as a young person of whether or not the glass was half full or half empty? Now, we all know the answer that everybody's looking for in today's age because that test has made its way out into public, but there's still that still small essence of the type of people that would answer the question whether it's half full or half empty, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, or, you know, but the thing that I look at it is, is it's not necessarily whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, because there are days that that glass is half full to me. But then there are days that glass is half empty. It is a perception, something that, Mattering on how you feel, depending on your mood, how your life is in order, or the things of things that transpire versus one for another. Of how you look at certain situations. One of the things that we could, you know, one of the tests that I took as a child was how far can a bear run into the woods? And the answer was halfway, because if he ran any further, he was running out of the woods. But, you know, that's still a matter of perception. Because a bear can run into the woods as far as he wants to and stops. You know, you can't determine how far he wants to do his thing. It's still a matter of mood. Moses was born into a very highly productive society in which they lived their lives based on the labor of men. And because those men were not Egyptians and were there, uh, um, they had to try to bring them into a place of, uh, of, of submission to the authority of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had taken the children of Israel and placed them into bondage and therefore uh, used them in the labor of building bricks for their society and their way of life. And when the children of Israel, you know, uh, um, if they even halfway fought against it, they would double the workload at times because uh, they wanted to make sure that the children of Israel did not feel like that they were a free people. Their whole lifestyle was built upon the servitude or the servitude of another people. I don't know about you, But that would make me angry. It would make me frustrated. It would make me upset. And let me say this. None of us in here really know the reality of being at the servitude of somebody else and not being able to break away. Now, our history is full of people and and ideologies of this type of magnitude uh, from generation to generation of people that took advantage of another group of people. And I'm here to tell you it was wrong. It was wrong. It was not something that should have been done. But because none of us really have ever been in that situation, we never would know how they would feel. But let me say this. If it was something that took place in such an era of life for several generations, which is what happened here, they would have also never have known what it was like to be free. They would have never known what it was like to be able to go to bed when they wanted to go to bed, eat when they wanted to eat, thus and so on and so forth. So as much as we're a free society, that society did not know what it was like to be free as much as we didn't know like what it was like to be in servitude. We have an idea. We have history books that tell us 
But none of us really know the pain and the heartache, the beatings and the things that took place. But God had a specific plan in mind when that baby was born. Being placed in the bulrushes, there for Pharaoh's daughter to find. Her motherly instincts kicking in, taking the baby in to raise it of her own self. And coming to a place in his life where now he is out and being a shepherd on the backside of the desert. Circumstances placing him at the right place at the right time. Now, when I say circumstances, I'm not talking about it being circumstantial. I'm meaning that God created the circumstances to place him where he needed to be. There are going to be times in your life that God is going to place you at specific places at specific times for specific reasons. And it would seem like a circumstance. But the circumstantial part of it is that God created the circumstances to get you to where you needed to be at that moment. That's why it's important for you to be prayed up. That's why it's important for you to be fasted up. That's why it's important for you to be living the life like you should be living because God needs you at that moment for that time and that reason. You're not going to run into a burning bush. Oh God, give me an answer. Oh! Yes, Lord. That's not going to happen. God doesn't manifest Himself in those ways now. God doesn't show up as an angel right there in the midst of of you cooking dinner and sitting there in the midst of you and telling you, I'm going to go destroy a city. I'm not saying God doesn't speak. I'm not saying that God doesn't send angels. I'm saying God has already made the ultimate manifestation. He is already the express image of God. There is no need for Him to manifest Himself in those ways anymore. The Holy Ghost is the ultimate manifestation of God. The Holy Ghost uh, is the ultimate thing that's supposed to lead and guide us and direct us into our pathways and our walk with God. And that's why it's important for us to be lived up and fasted up and prayed up. But because Moses didn't have the Holy Ghost, God chose to put him in a place uh, where a burning bush would speak to him and get him to where he needed to be. It took some convincing. I don't know that I've ever argued with God like Moses did. But God didn't take no for an answer back then. If you were to go to Nineveh, you were to go to Nineveh. If you didn't go to Nineveh, He created a great fish. I mean... Think of the biology of this fish to eat a man whole, yet his digestive juices did not chew you or disintegrate you. His whole sole purpose in life was to keep you alive underneath the ocean. Amazing how God does things. Now you can either choose to live in the belly of this fish Or you can choose to go do what I've called you to do. But the choice is yours. It's not much of a choice in my mind. I will go to Nineveh. Moses, arguing with God. God, I don't feel like I'm adequate enough. God, I don't feel like I'm able enough. God, I don't feel like I have the ability. God, who is it that I should say that they that, that sent me? And God answered time and time and time again. Finally to the place where Moses said he didn't have any more arguments left. Folks, Why are we still arguing with God? Why do we sit back on our pews of do nothing and expect God to send the things that we desire? I say it's because we're a microwave generation. But it's more because we're spoiled. 
We're living in a day and age where if I want a gallon of gas, I can just go right over here and buy a gallon of gas. The long lines at the gas, now that may happen, but we don't see the long lines at the gas pumps that you saw in the 70s. You don't see interest rates in the 20s percentile for homes like you did in the 60s and 70s. You don't see those things. Of course, houses back then only cost about $10,000 too. But, but you don't see those things taking place. Because in essence, we live in a spoiled generation. But the same is the difference of whether or not you live in a bonded generation. A people that has a way of lifestyle that they've built. Because people adapt. If you feel like that you are, are bound by things, you adapt to those. I'm sure Samson adapted to being strapped to a grinding mill. Moses goes in to the children of Israel. Hey, I'm here to deliver you. We don't want to be delivered. Now, God said that he heard the cry of his people. So there was somebody that desired to be delivered. That's why God's not a democracy. Not against democracies. Don't go back out and tell everybody, Brother Eves thinks we should have a dictatorship. I'm not against democracies. I think they're the best thing going. But God's not a democracy because God, when He sends a deliverer, sends it for everybody, not for just those that wish to be saved and those that don't. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. That all should come to repentance. We don't want to be delivered, Moses. What makes you think you have the right being the son of Pharaoh, being the adopted son of Pharaoh, to come in here and tell us what we want? Moses goes before Pharaoh. Now, I believe that Moses and Pharaoh had an idea of who each other was. Maybe they grew up in the same house. Maybe they were brothers of an adopted of some sort at one time or another. I don't know exactly, but there was no way that an outsider would get permission to walk into the court of Pharaoh unless they knew each other. And Moses, every time he demanded an audience with Pharaoh, he got what he asked for. Pharaoh, let my people go. And every time that he made a statement like that, Pharaoh would get his heart hardened. And God would have to send some kind of miraculous plague or some kind of delivering power to let Pharaoh know that I don't care what kind of pinnacle that you think you set upon. You don't have the power that I have. And some people and theologians and some books that you read will tell you that the plagues that God sent upon Egypt were this very same gods in which they worshipped. The frog the locust, the fire and those things that took place uh, saying uh, if you feel like you're raw and you feel like you've got power then try to stop what I'm doing Pharaoh decided that they could not go for sake of time, I won't go much into detail on a lot of things. If you want to read it, it's a very good book. It's the number one selling book in the United States of America. I was... <laughs> Remember when The Passion of the Christ came out? And uh, I, I'm not here to do a theological debate. But I, I was at work one day and somebody went to see the movie... And they come and they told me, they said, 
Ronnie, that was the best movie I've ever watched in my life. Somebody ought to write a book about that. I said, somebody did about 2,000 years ago. You can read it. It's called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They thought I was being a smart aleck. So without much going into detail, Moses and Pharaoh were standing there talking to one another. And Pharaoh made a commandment. And because of what he said, God told Moses, I will do it as he said. I will take the firstborn. Let Pharaoh know I will take his firstborn if he doesn't let my firstborn go. The reason, as much as we love our children, there was a purpose behind the firstborn that reached further than, than anything that we could ever imagine in Scripture because of the inheritance in which they would... Uh, but even, uh, even more so in Egypt. Because when the old Pharaoh died, those powers were transferred to the firstborn. The firstborn son. Because then he would become the new Ra, the new God that set upon the pinnacle of the pyramid. And so it was a very disturbing statement when Moses told Pharaoh, you had better wished that you had never said what you said. So Moses goes back to the children of Israel and this is where we find out the ones that really wanted to leave and those that did not want to leave. Because the law was to take a sacrifice and the blood of that sacrifice and put the blood upon the doorpost and upon the upper post. So that when the angel comes in, if he sees the blood, he would pass over. And here we have the exodus that takes place. I don't know if some of those that told Moses in the first place that we don't really want to be delivered were as excited as those that have been crying and praying to be delivered. Or if they were skeptical. You know, you have, you have two different types of people that sit in a church. You have those that are excited to be there and those that are just there to see who's going to fall on their face. So here we have those two types of people in the midst of a mass exodus. Over three and a half million people that are leaving Egypt at one time. I don't know that I could, could handle that many people at one given time and all their voices coming at me. But Moses was set up directly. And here he is leading the people. And I, I can imagine as they went around borrowing the things that God told them to take and, and, the, and all of the gold and the silver and the, the animals and all these things as they were getting their caravans together that there were people that was just, uh, you know, just so excited. They had smiles on their face. They were worshiping God. They were praising God. They were so excited uh, because of the delivering power of God. And, and they went out into the wilderness. And here they go on a day or two or three days journey. But something happened back in Egypt. See, the devil, he doesn't like when we feel like we're so powerful. When we get to a place where God has pulled us out, and we're in the midst of our tribulation, you know, our, our jubilation, and we're going along the way of God's been so good to me, I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. No, I cannot tell it all. There's something happening back in Egypt uh, where you came from, uh, where the enemy is being stirred uh, because of the trophies uh, in which he used to have his hands on uh, are now leaving in a mass exodus. Uh, and don't think that the enemy is not going to be far behind you to try to pick off the 
knows uh, in which he can stop them if he can. And then their first real obstacle takes place. Can I just say something? We're going to have revival. But that revival is not going to be without adversity. That revival is not going to be without crossroads. That revival is not going to be at, at, at a place uh, or are not going to be in a situation in which we don't run into something and we're going to have to say and get down on our knees and say, God, uh, what is it that I have to do from here? But in this situation of this mass exodus that takes place, uh, they get to a place in which they have nowhere else to go. The Bible says... And they tell Moses specifically, why? Why did you bring us here? And he turns around and he tells them, encouraging words. But evidently the situation was so devastating that we find the very next scripture, the Bible says that God asked Moses, why are you here crying to me? My job as a pastor is to get up behind this pulpit and preach encouragement, preach uh, uh, doctrine, preach truth, preach those things uh, to build your faith up. But there are times in my walk with God uh, where I've preached and given everything I've got, uh, but the answer still doesn't seem to be hitting like it needs to be. And I've got to go find my place uh, and fall on my knees before God uh, and ask God, where do I go from here? There are others in the Bible who had similar experiences. In Daniel, the decree was made. You can't pray like you want to pray. But Daniel, every day, opens his window like he had always done. Now see, let me say something to you. I believe it was okay for Daniel to pray openly like he did because he didn't change anything he was doing. Had Daniel heard the decree and had always prayed in his closet and said, you know what, I'm going to be a smart aleck and go right out to the window and open up the window and let them know who I stand for. I believe he'd been wrong. But because he didn't change, because he was solid in how he believed, because he stood upon the fact that he believed uh, that this is what my calling was. Uh, he goes to the window still and opens up his window and prays. But that deal still didn't stop him from facing the crossroad of entering into the lion's den. The three Hebrew boys have been taught about God their entire life been asked to serve into leadership and here they stood at the moment of a crossroad in their life where Nebuchadnezzar said uh, you bow yourself to this image uh, or you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace uh, they had a choice that they had to make that didn't stop them from having to face the fiery furnace Job, I can't imagine the news, Sister Trudy, of how many times they came to him and said, you lost your kids, you lost your goods, you lost your money, you've lost everything you've got. And the faith that it took, Brother Tim, for him to look them in their eyes and say, naked came I into the world. And naked shall I go. He could have very easily thrown his hands up in the air and said, I'll go back into bondage. No, he said, I'm going to push forward. That's right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Peter 
had denied Christ three times, rebuilt his relationship with God, preached the greatest message that had ever been preached in the face of the earth. And the Bible says they took him and put him in prison. What would we do? If they came to you and said, you got to stop serving Jesus or we're going to throw you in jail. Paul and Silas. All they had done was healed people in the name of Jesus. Done good things. And yet we find them beaten and thrown into the innermost part of the prison. Now there's a difference in being thrown in prison and being thrown into the sewer of the prison. One stinks. I can't imagine waking up in the midst of all of that mess. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I challenge myself tonight of how I would respond. I would hope that I'd have the faith to bunch old Silas in the arm and say, let's praise God. I would hope that I would have faith like Peter did and trust in the prayers of the church. I would hope that I would be like Job and say, at naked I came into the world and naked shall I go. I would hope I would be like the three Hebrew boys and say, I'm careful, I'm not careful to answer the old king. I will not bow. I hope I would be like Daniel and continue to be solid and open up my windows and pray unto the Lord. But I'm here to preach to you tonight that not everybody's that way. We need to have a solid foundation in who we are. That no matter what comes our way, I will not change. I will stand up for what is right. I will walk in the ways of truth. I will not bend, bow, or break. I will stand for the things of God. Have you ever found yourself in a desperate situation surrounded by people that didn't mean you any good? Perhaps overwhelmed by financial stress and strain? Found yourself going through the type of personal problems within your family? That has caused you to find yourself trapped uh, in the difficulty and the dilemma of desperation? Have you gotten to the point in your life where it seems as if the enemy has kept you from your destiny that God has ordained for you? Have you gotten to the point uh, where you're just about ready to give up? Uh, does it seem like uh, that your gumption of the Holy Ghost is gone? Uh, have you been haunted? Have you been sitting here in the sense uh, of almost faltering? Has your victory vanished? Uh, let me ask you today. Are you standing at a crossroad? Are you standing there? At one moment last week, you were dancing and praising God. But at this moment this week, you're standing there in the midst of all your turmoil and you're wondering. Where do I go? What do you do? We're stuck on the banks of the Red Sea. Stuck on the edge of our very existence. Mountains on one side. The Pharaoh bearing down on the back side. The destiny of the promised land is laying before us. But there's a great vast of waves and unsettled things that seem to be happening to a place where we just question God. And because we're frozen. 
and disabled by doubt, we found ourselves in the midst of bondage, financially, emotionally, spiritually. And because we're in bondage, we're stuck standing at the Red Sea or a problem of whatever magnitude you want to put it to tonight. We're standing there in the situation doing nothing. Because if we turn around, our past is right there. And if we go forward, I'm afraid that I don't have the faith to make it. (laughs) Can I tell you tonight to let your past go can I tell you tonight uh, that God didn't deliver you from Pharaoh for you to stand at the edge of your crossroad uh, and be worried that he's on your backside? Uh, can I tell you tonight uh, that it doesn't make a difference uh, what the enemy is telling you that my God has already designed a plan uh, for you? He has never in his entire existence uh, never given a situation where he's not been able to build a bridge if he has to oh there's some people in here that need to believe when I'm preaching tonight there's some people in here that need to say I'm willing to do whatever it takes I'm willing to do whatever it causes me to do because I'm willing to go the Bible says that the Lord said, stand, or excuse me, that Moses said, stand still yes, sir. Yes, sir. and watch or see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still just means uh, to relax your hands. Uh, off of it in other words you need to be willing to let go and let God do his thing but because we're such control freaks we try to hold on to it until the very last moment when we're caught in the situation we've got to let God We've got to learn to let God fight our battles. Oh, some of you need to hear what I'm preaching tonight. We've got to allow God to move in His own time, not in our time. We've got to be willing to let God uh, do it at His schedule, not our schedule. See, God doesn't have an alarm clock uh, that goes off at 5.30 in the morning. God doesn't have uh, a pot of coffee that He has to have uh, to get a hold of uh, and wake Him up uh, so He can take on the day. He doesn't have those things. Uh, That's not how God reacts. Uh, God is ever present at any given time and even though we get out of bed with sleep in our eyes and we stumble into our day our God is marching into the day ready for anything that comes his way he has never ever seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread We need to wait on God. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now there's a story out there of a bald eagle who had a crack in his beak and was unable to eat like he was supposed to. And evidently, according to the tale, a lot of the eagles, the bald eagles are this way, that they'll fly up into a high mountain and they'll sit on a perch and then they'll take their beak and knock it off with the rocks and wait until a new beak is formed. And even though they've been without 
energy and substance for weeks or how long it takes, days, weeks, whatever, that eventually that they'll sprout up with wings and soar again. Now, I'm trying to find the story that I've read many years ago, and I can't find it in a documentary anywhere. But I remember hearing that and reading that as a young boy. And I don't know if it was just a story or something that I come across. But the idea comes in mind. When we wait upon the Lord, that we shall renew our strength. That we shall mount up with wings as eagles. It's nothing more majestic than to see that bald eagle when it begins to take flight. And fly through the air. As if there is nothing that's going to stop it from its destiny. Destination. Uh, friend of mine, uh, when we wait upon the Lord, uh, there's a renewness of strength uh, that comes in us. Uh, that the difference between us uh, on this side uh, and the perception of those uh, on the other side uh, is the difference of a few feet uh, of those that were willing to wait upon the Lord. The difference between this shore where Pharaoh's on our backside and the shore of where he's swallowed up in the Red Sea is the perception that takes place of how God is able to deliver. But what I've come to preach to you tonight is that we don't need to wait till we get to the other side. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, that we walk by faith and not by sight. I want to know if there is a people inside this church uh, that is at the midst of a middle of a crossroad, uh, that's in the midst of situations and, des and destinations uh, in which you don't know how to get to, uh, and you feel like uh, that you've stalled out a little bit, and you feel like uh, that you bumped up against the wall, and you don't know which direction to turn. Uh, I'm here to preach to you. How many of you are going to pick up the timbrel in the midst of it and say, I know on the other side of the water that there is a God that is able to deliver me out of the midst of my bondage and my trial. Let's not wait until God does it. Let's pick up the timbrel now. Let's look through the view of the timbrel and see the delivering power of an almighty God that I'll pick it up. I'll dance. I'll shout. I'll praise. I'll do whatever it takes because I know what my God is able to do. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to pick up your timbrel. Somebody needs to pick it up. Somebody needs to know that I believe God is able. We've got some Daniels in this place that's in the middle of your lion's den. You need to pick up your timbre and begin to dance. We got some three Hebrew boys that are in the midst of the fire. But pick up your timbre and begin to dance. We've got Peter, who's in the midst of prison. But pick up your timbrel and begin to dance. Oh, come on, somebody. There's some faith that is moving into this building. Oh, come on. You're almost there. You're almost there. You're almost there. Paul and Silas in the jail is the ultimate example of somebody who was willing to pick up the timbrel in the middle of their circumstance. I'm going to praise him even if my God 
Does it deliver me? And in the midst of the praise, God began to move. Oh, come on, somebody. What is your view from the other side of the timbrel? What do you see through the view on the other side of the timbrel? I'm going to lay it here. I didn't even have to tell her what she needed to do. Come on. Come on. I may not have a tambourine for any of everybody in here. But some of you need to get your spiritual tambourines out and begin to praise God anyhow. I know I've got four than them four ladies that needed to hear this. I know I've got others out there that needed to hear. Oh, come on. Come on. I will not bend, bow, or break. I will not fall or falter. I will not give in or give up. I will stand. Oh.
That's it, church. Come on. That's it, church. Come on. That's it, church. Come on. Never 
to dance with that timbrel. She praised God for the victory that had just taken place. But they still were not in a place of destiny. What she saw was a promise of God. If we can take our spiritual timbrels and put them in a place where we can see the promises of God, The Bible says that some of them had died having seen the promise afar off. They didn't quite make it to where God's destiny was. But because they had their spiritual timbrels in the right place, they still could see the deliverance of God. We're not where our destiny is. There is a much better place. But in order for us to get there, we've got to walk through this place first. But He has promised that He will never leave us nor forsake us. That He will always be there. And Jesus Christ was the ultimate one that faced a crossroad. He had to choose whether to go to the valley of the cross or not go I'm so glad that even Jesus himself said not my will but thine be done and three days later on the other side of the gulf after having spent three days in the heart of the earth he came out victorious we're not a defeated church We are a victory church. We are a church that is alive. We are a church that's full of promise. We are a church that knows that there is a destiny in which we are trying to achieve. Revival is ours if we choose to have it. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's not forget our fast days this week. What day is that? All right. I know some of you were forced to fast, not wanting to necessarily because you were in the hospital. And uh, that's not the kind of fasting we want to do. So just make sure that you take care of yourself to the best of your ability. Uh, They weren't in the hospital because they fasted. Let me clarify. 
but when you're in a place like that, you might ought to eat and take care of yourself a little bit. Amen. But we are certainly grateful for those that did participate, and we're hoping that that number grows this week because we want to have revival, don't we? How many want to have revival? Amen. Praise God. Be in prayer for those that are coming over the next few weeks uh, of young men that are going to be here, as well as Brother Grimsley. Keep him in your prayers. And on a second note, school started this week, so we need to pray for the teachers, I mean uh, the children. I'm just kidding. I believe, and, and let me say this, some of our kids go to public school, some of our kids go to private school, um, the, and some of them are homeschooled. Um, um, and, and, and however you choose to educate your kids is your business. But the realities is real out there of the things that they face. So I'm going to ask all of our children that are school age to come into the front right now. You adults, let's gather in behind them. Let's get some of our children's ministers to come into the front of them tonight if we can. Our youth leaders. Let's take a moment here. Let's pray for our kids, shall we? Hallelujah. Father, we know God. Above all things, Lord, you said in your word to suffer not the little children to come unto you. And we as a church take our children very seriously. We pray tonight, God, that you reach down and touch them in a mighty way, Lord. That you protect their minds from the things that are not supposed to be in their God. Lord, that you put a touch in their heart, Lord, to serve you in the midst of adversities, O oh God. We pray, God, Lord, that a hedge of protection, God, be placed over them in a mighty way, Lord. As some have already started school and some are starting school this week. Uh, Lord, we pray, God, uh, no matter what avenue of school that they choose to go to, God, uh, that you are there in the midst of their learning, God, uh, to develop them, Lord, and place inside of them uh, a heart uh, to live and to trust you, O oh God. I pray, Lord, from uh, the age of kindergarten all the way up to high school and graduation, even in college, uh, God, that you move in the midst of them, Lord, uh, and touch them, God. God Guide them and direct them, Lord. And touch the parents, God, as they try to teach them the truth in this last day and age. In Jesus' name, 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 in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. God bless you. How many are excited that you came to the house of the Lord? Amen. Praise God. Don't forget tomorrow night if you are in town and uh, you're not, you know, already got plans, that Brother David Johnson would love to have you at the nursing home as a part of the prayer uh, ministry that we are doing there. I do know it is a holiday, but if you are in town and don't have plans, what better way to spend it than to try to help somebody through prayer. Amen? Praise God. Amen. 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 Brother Don Bowen, dismiss us in a word of prayer.
You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Greet each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord.